Uh, the title of the message is We've Come to the End. I don't know if that's the greatest grammar there. I think it's We've Came to the End, but uh, I, I don't like the idea of that. We have reached the end. Anyway, we have come to the end of the year. We are going to be reading from the end of the Bible that is really dealing with the end of times. And so we have come to the end, and I want to just look at uh, some of this here this morning. Let's ask God's blessing on the ministry of His Word, and then we'll take up the text that's before us. Father, thank you for, again, the good morning you've already blessed us with. We're looking forward to a great time together in your Word. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will be our teacher here this morning. May we learn from you uh, as we study this text and just really take a some inventory with regard to a review of this past year, where we are spiritually, where we had hoped to be. And I pray, Father, that you'll challenge us anew and afresh as we conclude this year and look forward to the new, uh, that uh, we'll even do better in the year 2018 in our walk with you. And Lord, for that, we'll thank you. And so we want to commit ourselves to you and ask your blessing on this time, for it's in Jesus' name we do pray, amen. The story is told of two preachers who were standing by the side of a road holding up a sign that read this, The end is near. Turn around before it's too late. One speeding motorist yelled out his window, Leave us alone, you religious nuts, and he flew by. From around the curve, they could hear the screeching of tires and a big splash. Do you think, said the one preacher to the other, we should have just put a sign up that said, Bridge out instead. Well, the end is near. They didn't like that message. They might have heeded the challenge, bridge out instead. But uh, the truth of the matter is the end is near. Turn around or adjust your schedule before it is too late. Or it reminded me of another story that I remember sharing with you before as well, where a preacher went to visit an elderly lady to talk about the hereafter. And uh, as he arrived at the house, she invited him in, and she said, uh, the preacher said, I'm, I'm here to talk, you about, talk to you about the hereafter. Uh, to which the lady responded, oh, no problem. She said, uh, she said, I'm well familiar with the hereafter. She said, every time I go to the pantry, I wonder, what am I hereafter? Uh, that was a different hereafter that uh, the preacher was hoping to talk about. But we have already now come 365 days, I think, uh, into this year, and I'm just curious as to where you are, uh, where I am spiritually with regard to some of our goals, our ambitions, our desires back in January of this year. Are you one of those individuals that set, uh, set out with uh, some New Year's resolutions that I am going to do this in the new year? Are you one of those individuals? You can raise your hand uh, some do that. Okay, good, good. It's okay to do that. Uh, set goals is good. Uh, you know what they say, aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So it's all right to set a goal, to, to take a challenge and say, hey, I want to do that. Sometimes we shy away from resolutions because you've been there, done that before, and you don't bring those resolutions to fruition. And so you say, really, I'm, I'm not going to do that any longer. But I would say don't ever stop at challenging yourself with regard to a number of areas in your, in your life. Um, for instance, a lot of us are really, uh, you know, the new year, I'm going to go on a diet. Amen? Anybody, one of those individuals here going to diet in the year 2018? Okay, you're not raising your hand, but you may have talked about it. Uh, how about I'm going to get more exercise in this new year? I'm going to definitely do that. I'm I'm going to join the gym, and I'm going to, again, lose 20 pounds. Amen? Uh, Okay, yeah, I know. Well, maybe we're all in this together. I guess the message is over. I don't know. (laughs) You heard about the guy that joined the gym a year later? said to his wife, I never lost a pound. I joined that gym a year ago, and I didn't lose anything. The wife said, well, don't you think you have to go to the gym, honey? Uh, I know. These are pretty lame here this morning. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um... Hey, listen, uh, whether it's diet, uh, gym, uh, they are some uh, physical things that we might talk about. But how about spiritual matters? Did you take a challenge with regard to 2017 that maybe you're going to read the Bible more than you ever read it before? Amen? Some of you do that? All right, that's a good thing. I think that's great. I hope that you were able to follow through with that. I don't know how far you got in your reading, but but, uh, maybe it's more than you ever read before, so you accomplished that goal. That's a good thing. Praise God. 
And then as Dallas has already pointed out to us, we're going to take a challenge as a church family to really try to read through more of Scripture this year. And so just keep challenging yourself to that end. I think that's good. How about, how about maybe a challenge to witness more? Did you take a challenge to say, hey, listen, I am going to beg God for boldness and courage and strength, and I'm going to, I'm going to share the gospel with a coworker or a neighbor or a family member. I'm going to do that. And maybe you never did that before. Well, there's a goal. I, I, I think that's a noteworthy goal. I highly recommend you do that. Uh, I really believe that you have been commissioned by the Lord himself to do that. So forget what I'm saying, but the Lord has already told us to go into the world, preach the gospel. And that's not limited to the pastor or to the leaders in a church. It's really to all of us uh, to preach the gospel. And so that's a noteworthy goal. How about some other goals? Like, um, you know, I'm going to take the challenge to attend more services than I've ever had before at Kendall Park Baptist Church. Maybe you're one of these individuals that only come to the morning service. Uh, you come at 11 o'clock and that's all you get. Uh, I would like to challenge you to come to Sunday school. Uh, take the challenge and say, you know, by God's grace, I'm coming to Sunday school next Sunday, starting the new year, and I'm going to be here for 52 of those Sundays next year. Every Sunday I'm going to be in Sunday school. Isn't that a good goal? I think it's a great goal, personally, and it's not because I'm the pastor, but it's another opportunity to hear the Word of God, and you'll hear from a different individual, most likely. Uh, Reuben teaches the adults, and then we have all these different teachers uh, downstairs. Uh, uh, Jared's teaching the teens. Dallas is doing the young adults. Charlotte's teaching the, uh, some of the kids. Sylvia's been teaching our little guys for a long time, and I'm grateful for that. They love to come to Sunday school. I, you ought to be in Sunday school, amen? I think that's a good thing to do. If you've never taken a challenge, then take the challenge and say, you know what, next year I'm going to really make it an effort. Maybe you're one of those individuals that you just think, well, you know, I only get Sunday off, pastors and, uh, Pastor, and really to come back Sunday night, you're, you're really asking an awful lot. Uh, well, listen, I'm not so much asking as much as I really think that the Lord would have you to come back. This is his local church. Uh, this is something that's been established uh, many years ago. We think the Lord's Day is a special day. We ought to be in church and so we kind of like coming back. I, I will tell you this. I confess, though, that I haven't always been where I am today. I remember, I remember uh, you know, getting saved and then uh, hearing about these people that went to church Sunday morning for Sunday school and morning, and then they came back Sunday night, and I thought, good night. I already did an extra hour because I come out of a religious background. And I put my hour in. I was good to go. And then uh, I thought, wow, I, I did two hours. I did Sunday school and the morning. That's pretty good. And and, uh, you know, God just continued to work in my heart and my life and my wife's life. And so we decided we're going to start going back Sunday night. And uh, you know what? It just became, it became habit. It, it was something good. We enjoyed it. I, I don't ever remember, like, oh, do I have to go to church Sunday? No, we, we loved it. We loved the people of God. We liked being around the Word of God. And so uh, going back to church Sunday night wasn't a problem. It just became, and, and, you know, as time went on, my kids never asked. They never said, Dad, are we going to Sunday school this morning? They already knew the answer to that. And they never asked, are we going to church Sunday night? They knew the answer to that. And they never asked if we're going to go to church at Wednesday night. They already knew the answer to that. And I want to tell you, God has blessed us as a result of it. I can't emphasize that enough. I cannot tell you how good God has been to us. And I just think it's because we have always put him first. He is to be the preeminent one in our life. And so we want to do the things he wants us to do and be around the people that he wants us to be and under the word, the sound of God's word. And so things of that sort uh, are really good. Uh, maybe giving is another area that you could maybe consider or think about. Um, I don't know what your giving's like. I don't get into any of that stuff. I just see the totals. That's all I ever see and that's all I ever need to see. But uh, I don't know where you are, spiritually speaking, with regard to giving. But do you really believe that everything that you have has been given to you by God? Do you believe that? Amen. I believe that. Uh, everything I have has been given to me by God. And so he is certainly uh, entitled to, to his portion and then some. He allows me to keep 90% and I give him 10%. That's, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? I think that's a great deal. We call that tithing, and that's always our base point for giving. We always start with a tithe. But we really believe in grace giving, which is above and beyond tithing. Some of you would say, well, boy, do you tithe on the, the net income or the uh, or the grace? Uh, hey, listen, I you can't outgive God. It reminds me of a farmer who, who uh, I, I can't remember the, the, all the story, but he used, to, he used to take good care of his cattle, and he used that as an, an analogy one day in services. And I don't know if he was teaching a Sunday school or whatever, but 
He said, you know, the, the, the deal is I, I keep shoveling into God's bin and he keeps shoveling back into my bin. But he said, you know what the difference is? His shovel is bigger than my shovel, which means that I reap a whole lot more than what he ever gets. And so you can't outgive God. And so uh, if you've never taken a challenge with regard to giving, that's something that you ought to consider uh, with regard to giving, starting with tithing and then above and beyond missions. Maybe, I don't know what you give with missions, but ours is a faith program, faith-based program. Uh, we take on missionaries. We promise that we'll support them X amount of dollars per month. Uh, our missions giving, uh, boy, I should have did some homework, is over, what, $4,000 a month or whatever. I can't remember. Somewhere in the area of 48000 I guess, a year is what we're committed to giving. Now, our church gives a lot more than the 48000 because we have missions conferences. We have different love gifts and things of that sort. But just missionaries alone, we, we have promised to say, hey, we're going to keep you on the field, serving God, representing us as a church, all over the world, uh, and as a result of that, we have pledged to pray for you and support you financially, and you know, God has blessed us as a result of that, and we're grateful for, again, missionaries that are out there on the front line, because you and I aren't called to the country of Spain or to Lebanon or to France or wherever else it might be. You and I are called to stay here, and so we serve the Lord here, but we certainly want to support missions. We think that's a good thing to be involved in. Uh, the building fund. Some of you, again, went above and beyond with regard to the building fund this year. Again, um, uh, I can't remember. What's the number there? Is it 40 some thousand dollars? 40, let's see, is that number in here? Uh, 42,000 came in and maybe another extra 300 above that. So it's really about 42,800, I think it is. Uh, so uh, almost uh, $43,000 has come in above and beyond, again, our regular giving to, to pay off our debt. And again, I can't, I can't commend you enough for that sacrificial giving on your part. A number of you have given above and beyond. But I appreciate, again, some of you saying, hey, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to, I'm going to stand by this, and I'm going to do that. And, and uh, God blesses you for doing those things. He really, really does. So I say all of that to say that, hey, we've come to the end of the year. Now it's time to evaluate. How did we do? Did we take some of those challenges early on in the year and say we're going to do that? And, and then do we stick to it? Or maybe we did some and then we fell behind a little bit or we did that. Hey, listen, you're, you're making, are you making progress? Are you going in the right direction? I hope so. I hope so. And uh, I would say, again, this is a good time of the year as we come to the end to really just stop and think about where we really are with regard to those matters. It was the beginning of uh, this year, 2017, that I brought a challenge uh, uh, to our church family. And it was on the very first day of January 2017. The title of the message that day was, Lord, Change Me. Lord, Change Me. And that's been in our prayer sheets all, all year long, and that is that, Lord, where I need to change, change me. I, I don't want to be the same. I don't want to be stuck in a rut. I don't want to just go through the motions. I don't want to just play church. I, don't want, to, I, want, I want to be more like Christ at the end of the year. So, Lord, have your way in my heart and change me. I have to tell you a funny story with regard to that. I... All our kids are getting ready to leave, and we always have a word of prayer before our kids leave and head out. And boy, they've traveled many miles these last few days. They're in Michigan and Texas. They're heading down there in Florida and all over the place. And so we pray, and we pray for journeying mercies and, and uh, for the vehicle to work well. And then I always add this and give the, the driver a good attitude. Now, maybe some of you don't need that prayer, but some of us do need that prayer. Uh, I have a son, Josh, and he's, uh, he's just he's incredible. Uh, he was heading to Texas, and he went by way of Bloomsburg to visit some friends up there. And I'm thinking, man, that's out of your way, and you already got 20-some hours to get to Texas. Ah, not a big deal. And then I talked to him late last night. I said, hey, how are you making out? Uh, he said, we're doing pretty good, he said. We're just kind of getting there. We're down in Kentucky now. But he said, uh, Route 80 was shut down, and we were detoured off. A detoured off a road when you have 20-some hours of driving is not really what... But it didn't really seem to phase him. It really doesn't bother him. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord... That boy's got his mama's attitude. I'm telling you, that's a good attitude to have. Uh, uh, I need to be praying that God would give me that kind of an attitude. I see detour, and I got 20 hours of driving. It's like, I'm not really happy at camper with all that. But listen, God changed me, and I'm praying to that end that I would have a better attitude, whether it's driving or whatever it is. So that was the goal, and my question again to you is we come to the end of the year, and we're looking back. Have we become more like Christ? Is there changes in our life? Are we, are we doing things differently than what we were doing uh, uh, 365 days ago? What, what's different about 2017? Or is it just another year where we just kind of pass time by and just, well, just another year has come and gone? 
Time is a precious commodity and it needs to be used well and wisely and we need to be a good steward of it. And uh, I hope and pray that, again, you don't just kind of let it fly by without really doing some self-inventory, some evaluating in your life. I hope change has been there. I hope it is evident. Uh, I liked what Charles Stanley said with regard to this. He said, we know we should avoid a certain place, but we go there anyway. He said, we recognize a personal weakness for a particular activity, but we tempt ourselves anyway. He said, how often do we fall into sin because we plan to do it? And I thought of that with regard to the song we sang here today. I thought this was kind of interesting because I knew I had that in my notes here this morning. But we were just singing about take the name of Jesus with you. And we sang verse 2. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Don't just go along with the flow of things like, well, I just couldn't help myself. No, I think Stanley's on to it. We know that we are to avoid certain places, but we go there anyway. We know that we're to avoid certain weaknesses in our life, but we tempt ourselves anyway. He said, we don't fall into sin. We plan for sin. That is a stern rebuke. And so I want you to think about that. Have you avoided sin? Have you, have you steered away from it? Or have you just allowed it to happen? Uh, again, all of this by way of introductory remarks here. Uh, I, I made another note here with regard to being open to growing, uh, open to change. You know, change is sometimes fearful for some people. They don't like change. We like status quo. We like everything just kind of moving on. That's our comfort zone. That's our bubble that we live within. And don't, don't push me beyond that. That, that, makes, that. that makes me nervous. That gets me, uh Hey, change is good, folks, if it's, it's, if it's for the Lord and for His glory. Change is good. So, so I, I hope and pray that you'd be open to changing. I hope that you're, again, asking the Lord to change you. That was the whole idea as we began this year, 2017. Might have quoted from John Wooden, uh, a basketball coach out at UCLA, won 10 national championships. He's a legend in his own right. He's now on, passed on to eternity. But he said this, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. You know that we should be reading the Bible. You know that. But what are we doing about it? You know that we should give or that we should be faithful to the services. You, we know these things. What do we do after we know it? That's what counts. Uh, I, I remember a basketball coach when I was in high school, and this guy was a stickler for just the very basics. And he'd run those guys ragged, doing just basic, extra, basic uh, defensive moves and things of that sort. And this was already after they had already practiced and they were worn out and tired, but he wanted them, when they were tired, to have it so ingrained in their being that, hey, listen, I know that this, this is what I need to do. And it, and it almost becomes rote. It almost becomes part and parcel to your being. I say that for this reason. Maybe you're one of those individuals that plan to have devotions at the end of the day. Maybe you're, you're not a morning person, you're a night owl, and so your desire is to say, well, listen, when I get home from work, and I'm, you know, I'm going to spend some time with the family, and blah, 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 and I'm going to have time in the Word later on. And maybe it's been a long day. Maybe you're tired. And it's like, you know, I am exhausted. I can just wait for another day. No, it's what you do when you're tired. It, it's what you do when you already know what to do that makes the difference. I know I need to do this. And so you just jump in there and get in the Word. And I think, again, that's critical for our well-being, our spiritual well-being. And Ben Franklin, again, I quoted this guy before, but I really liked He said, when you're finished changing, you're finished. When you're finished changing, it's over. You're finished. Don't ever stop changing. So, again, I'm, I'm asking you as you reflect back on the year 2017, what were your goals? What did you desire to do? Have you accomplished any of those? Are you more like Christ today? We have come to the end of the year. God bless you with health and strength, the ability to think and reason and move about and do. And what has that done for you in the cause of Christ? If you're not changing, you're not more like Christ, then you're finished. Or I like what Bill Clinton said. President Bill Clinton said the price of doing the same old thing is far higher than the price of change. It's almost like the, uh, the definition for insanity. You know what that is? 
doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Well, what are you doing to change? What are you doing again that's going to cost you again to become more like Christ? And I would hope and pray that there would be a number of things in your life. I, I like the story of the converted cannibal in South Sea Islands, sitting by a large pot reading the Bible. When an anthropologist came his way and said, what are you doing? The native replied, I'm reading the Bible. The anthropologist scoffed and said, don't you know that modern civilized man has rejected that book? It's nothing but a pack of lies. You shouldn't be wasting your time reading it. To which the cannibal began to look him over from head to toe and slowly replied, Sir, if it weren't for this book, you'd be in this pot. Uh, there is a change that is good for that cannibal. Uh, I like that. Uh, change, again, is profitable, and I hope and pray that you're well on your way to really becoming all that God wants you to be. And just one more quote, and then we're going to look at this. Henry Blackaby uh, and Avery Willis wrote a book entitled On Mission with God. They said this, and I thought this was interesting. God doesn't enter into your life to pamper you or to indulge you. He comes to involve you in the greatest adventure of life experiencing his glory as you accompany him on his mission. By joining him, by joining Christ on his mission, you will experience God and be forever changed in the process. That's good. You know, we live in a society, we're talking about that in our Sunday school area, where we're, we're, we have a tendency to want to be pampered and, and coddled and cared for and you know, we stub our toe and we ask God to, man, help me get over the pain and the suffering and all and and uh, God may do that, but listen, I think there's, there's far greater prayers we could be praying in the midst of that is, Lord, teach me the lessons you want me to learn in the midst of all this. And, and Lord, help me to rely on your grace that I know is sufficient to meet my every need and things of that sort rather than just get a quick bailout. Blackaby goes on and says, you are not just a channel through which God does something, but you are trans a transformed part of his eternal purpose to make you and all people of the world like his son for his glory. God moves dramatically in us, not just to make us happier people or to fix all of our problems, but he works in us to transform us into men and women who will exhibit his nature on the earth and give the world a glimpse of Jesus. So again, putting it in perspective, people seeing Christ in you this year in 2017. When they look at your life, do they see changes? Do they see something that's different? Does it glorify God? And if there isn't any of that happening, then something's wrong. Something is not right with regard to where we are. The book of Revelation, I, I like this because as already indicated, uh, we've come to the end of the year. We're at the end of the book, and we're dealing with end times. And he begins in verse 1 of this book, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, where he writes this. I, I like this or has this recorded for us. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is the subject of the book. It's, it's about Jesus Christ. This book is about Christ. And then it goes on and tells us what the purpose is, uh, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's a, that, the purpose of the book is to, to show things which will shortly come to pass, the things that will come to pass. Now, for you and I, where we live today, we're living here today in, in, uh, in the present and we look at the book of Revelation and say, well, you know, that's futuristic. These are things that are going to happen down the road. That's true. Uh, this, what we're going to read in the book of Revelation, has not yet happened. Uh, so, so, but he is prophesying. Uh, God is, again, revealing this information to his son uh, with regard to what, the, what his uh, son, again, can anticipate with regard to the future. And so this information is coming to him, and it's going to show us uh, things like uh, the tribulation years that are going to come into play when we get to Revelation chapter 6 and then run all the way through to chapter 19 with regard to the, the, uh, the various judgments that are going to take place, the, the seal judgments and the bowl judgments and trumpet judgments and things of that sort. It's going to be a terrible time here on this earth. And, and this is a revelation of what is yet future. But it's, it's the end time. When, when, when he gets done with all of that, Christ returns, establishes a literal kingdom here on earth. This is all here in Revelation. 
Uh, and that will be for a thousand years. That's Revelation chapter 20. And after the thousand years, we're moving into all of eternity. We have the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. And so this really is a book about end times and what we can expect and anticipate. And uh, there's blessings for those that read it and study it and hear it preached and things of that sort. But the purpose is, again, it's, uh, it's to certainly tell us the, uh, about these things that just shall uh, shortly come to pass. So it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, Christ, to show unto his servants, that's what Christ did to show his servants, which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So John is the author, and he's going to take this information that has been given to him by way of this angel and record this for these 22 chapters. And it is a great, great read. Uh, uh, verse 2, I'll just, I'm not going to read all these. I want to get down to the latter part of it. Verse 2, though, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. There's great fruit that comes by way of reading this particular book. And I will tell you, I will confess that reading uh, the book of Revelation can be challenging. There's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of uh, things you have to think through, but, but stay with it, read it. It will often explain itself, but uh, there are blessings that come from doing that. So that's the introduction into the book. And then I want to get over here to uh, this area of verses uh, 7 and 8. Verse 7 and 8. So you could read the, these verses in between, but we come down here. Behold, verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds. That's with a reference to Jesus Christ. He's coming with clouds. And uh, this is really uh, clouds of glory. Uh, this is, the, uh, as it were, the Shekinah glory of God. Uh, we would read about this in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. You would read, immediately after the tribulation of those days. That's going to be pointed out in chapter 6 through 19 of this book. After the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and, they shall, and then shall all tribes of the earth mourn, now listen to this, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You know, we mentioned a little bit about that uh, last Sunday night we were talking about in our Christmas Eve service about Christ's first coming, uh, which is, by the way, recorded for us in the Gospels. His second coming is recorded for us here in the book of Revelation. And, uh, you know, when Christ came the first time, uh, the Jewish people were, were not ready for him. They had heard he was coming, they anticipated it, but he came and they didn't believe it. Uh, and we talked about that. Uh, we know that he's coming again, folks. He's coming again. And I'm talking about a literal coming where he's going to come to this earth and establish a literal kingdom here on this earth. And that's all, again, prophesied in this particular chapter. When he comes the second time, not the rapture, but when he comes to establish the kingdom, he's going to come blazing in glory. And everybody's going to be able to see him. We talked about the technology last week. We talked about, you know, why has God not come back? Why has he not raptured his home and started that tribulation period and and begun that clock working toward the second coming. I don't know. That's God's business, not mine. But I do know this. When he comes, everybody's going to see him, as the text tells us. The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That is, again, supported in Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in glory and all his holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So he is coming, as the text tells us here. Verse 7, but when he cometh with clouds, it's clouds of glory, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Who are those that pierced Christ? It's really the Jewish people that were responsible for the death of Christ. Now listen, I know that we can get into the semantics of saying, well, we know it was the Romans that put him on the cross. It was the Jewish people that were uh, crying out, crucify him. But in essence, really all of us are guilty of really nailing Christ to the cross. I understand that, and that's true. But the text of Scripture would tell us that the Jews are primarily responsible for Christ going to the cross. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22 and following, uh, uh, Peter speaking to Israel, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. It wasn't a mistake that Christ ended up on the cross. He says, ye have taken 
and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. That was an indictment on the Jewish people. He came unto his own. He came to the Jewish people. He, he, they were his people. Uh, the, the, the promised Messiah was to the Jewish people. And, and so the Messiah has come, and, and, then, and then they don't believe it. They don't, well, I don't believe you're the Messiah. And it may be because they had different visions of what their Messiah really was going to be. Uh, they expected him maybe to come in a, a blazing glory then, but he came in a very humble way. Uh, maybe they, uh, they, they expected this Messiah to overthrow the Roman Empire and, and give freedom to those that lived in Israel. And Well, their plans and God's plans were different. But he did come, and they rejected him. And so the Bible says, you men of Israel, you are the ones that are responsible for his death. And so I want to stay with that text. Uh, Acts chapter 3, it will go on and tell us the same thing. You denied the Holy One and just and desired a murder to grant it unto you. And that's what they did, Barabbas instead of Christ. And they killed the prince of life. So who is this in verse 7? Behold, he cometh with clouds, that's clouds of glory, and every knee, I'm sorry, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, <coughs> and those that pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. The idea of wailing is that they're mourning. Why are they mourning the, uh, th this one that is coming now in all this glory? Well, you know why they're mailing, wailing and Mourning him is because of their guilt for sin, their fear of punishment. Uh, the, the king, the righteous judge has come back, and they are fearful of what he is going to do, and so they are mourning uh, this coming of Christ. And it's really kind of a sad text. So he's going to come to earth. All the kindreds and those that pierced him shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And that would really be the response of the, the believers as we look forward to the return of Christ. Of course, we will be with him when he comes. And then he says this, and this is where I want to just kind of camp for a few minutes. He said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, uh, the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. The Alpha and the Omega, what is that? Well, that's the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. It would be the equivalent of our A and Z in English. In our English alphabet, we have 26 letters. In the Greek alphabet, there's 24 letters. But think of what you can do with 26 letters, the words that you can construct with 26 letters. I didn't take the time, and I meant to do that. I thought I would maybe have some fun and find out how many actual words are there in, in the English vocabulary. I, I, I don't know. I'm not talking about the average person, but how many words have been constructed? And... I have, a, I have a book in my office. I am not exaggerating. It's about that thick, about that wide. It's one of these big books that my wife and kids keep trying to get rid of. And yet I have kept that dictionary for years only because I'm just impressed with the size of that thing. It's, it's humongous. And uh, the wording that's in that book is just incredible. What does that have to do with Christ being the Alpha and the Omega? Well, just as in the alphabet, there are endless combinations uh, that can hold and convey all knowledge, so it is with Christ. Uh, he is, again, the supreme, the sovereign, as it were, alphabet. There is nothing outside of his knowledge. There is no unknown factors that can sab sabotage his second coming. Uh, he, again, spans time and eternity. He exhausts the vocabulary of excellence. He is the source and goal of creation. He who began will end the divine program on his watch, on his timetable. Some of you and I like to control things. And, but listen, we really are a pawn in the hand of an incredible God who's orchestrating all things again after the purpose of his own will. And he knows when the end will be and he has it all mapped out and he is the beginning. He is the ending. He is the alpha. He is the omega. All things are under the very control of God. Jesus expresses God's fullness, his comprehensiveness, his all-inclusiveness. All of this, again, is involved in that title. It would certainly be, as well, maybe a reference to the very deity of Christ, and we could look at that, and if we took time, we could go back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, and uh, or 41, 44, and 48, and different places where we would read that I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. And you'd read that over and over again in Scripture. 
reference again to Jehovah God, and here Christ is taking on that same title with regard to the Alpha and the Omega, and an interesting title to say the least. But in the context of what we're looking at here in this book here, he is again the author, the finisher of our faith. He has all things under his control. Uh, there is uh, nothing that will surprise him or take him by surprise. He begins things and then carries it through to completion, even our salvation. He's the very first verse of Genesis. He's the last verse of Revelation. He's the first and the last. He is all in all with regard to salvation. I chose that particular text to really just again remind us that as we come to the end of the year, to the end of the Bible, to dealing with the end times, we are reminded here in this particular text of a God who is already miles ahead of us. He's the Alpha, He's the Omega, the beginning, the end. He's got it all mapped out. I wonder where do I fall into the scheme of things with regard to all of that. Of course, He knew I would be born. He knows when I'll die. He knows what I'll do with my life. Uh, he knows where I'll spend my eternal days. He knows everything about me as he does with you. Where do I fit into all of that? Well, he's given me choices. He's given me opportunities to know him, to love him, to serve him, to be like him, to be more like him. And so I like to take a text like this and just kind of reflect and think, where am I? What have I accomplished in 2017? Did I set goals? Did I accomplish those goals? Am I more like Christ today? Or am I the same old, same old? The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, he's got it all mapped out. But I want to fit into his plan. I want to fit into his, his uh, purpose for my life. He goes on and closes with this text, which is which was, which is to come, the Almighty or the all-powerful God. And I believe that text is, uh, the Almighty is mentioned uh, maybe some eight times here in the book of Revelation. All things are possible with Him. And so I want to challenge you here this morning with regard to coming to the end of the year and thinking, okay, well, maybe I didn't accomplish all that I would have liked to, but hopefully you have made progress. A new year is about to begin, and we'll talk about the beginning of the new year tonight and what you're planning to do, and what you'd like to accomplish. But as we come to the end, evaluate your life. What have you been able to do for the Lord? Again, are you more like Christ today than you were a week ago or a year ago? Are you changed? Are you open to that? Has there been progress in your life? And I would hope and pray that you could say, yes, praise God, there has been, and by His grace will continue to be, even as we move from one year to the next but don't let the year pass without at least stopping and thinking about where you are, spiritually speaking. Let's pray. I want to personally thank you for...